hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, <laughs> hemispheric lateralization. This is an interesting thing. This is a concept that the, or, or the fact that certain activities only happen on one side of the brain versus the other side of the brain. Interesting. How like your, well, basically what's happened, here's a quick overview of the right-handed person. On a right-handed person, the right hemisphere is going to do music, artistic abilities, creativity. The left side doesn't do that. The left side does the language, math, logic. So if you have a stroke on one side of the brain, that's what's going to get affected, at least in a right-handed person. On a left-handed person, which is about 10% of the population, it's the opposite. The right hemisphere in a left-handed person does language, math, and logic, whereas the left hemisphere does the artsy-fartsy kind of thing. So that's where the, um, the idea of are you right-sided brain or left side so that's what they're coming up with on, on that way. Are you more of the creativity, artsy kind of person? Or are you more of the <coughs> facts kind of person, science and math? Okay? Um, so I give you a little idea about that. Okay? Um, and I don't know, before people ask me, what ambidextrous people do, how that works, because I don't know. And, and let's face it, ambidextrous means that you could do everything with right and left. It does not mean that I could play ball in my left hand, but I write with my right hand. That's not ambidextrous. Ambidextrous means you can play ball, like bat, use a bat with your right hand or your left hand in a good either way. And you could write with your right and left hand the same way. I personally never met anybody that can do that. I have met people who can play a guitar this way, but then write with their left hand. So that's not ambidextrous. Not true ambidextrous. And if I was, if someone was true, I, I would, I would cut off my left arm just to be ambidextrous. <laughs> all right. So that's just a quick overview of the two. All right. So each hemisphere also controls motor activities on the opposite side, which we dealt with with the cortical spinal tract because they cross over at the medulla, so they control the other side. So here's a little bit more detail what the right hemisphere does. Besides the artsy-fartsy stuff, musical, artistic, and creativity, it does pattern perception. That's the kind of stuff that you did when you were a kid, where you have this ball that has different size or different shaped holes in it, and you've got to figure out what shape goes in that hole. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay? Or the game Perfection, if you've ever seen Perfection, it's that kind of thing recognizes faces, recognizes emotional contact, content of the facial expression, not what is actually said. If there was windows on these doors here, and I come walking to the door, the room is closed, but I see two students in here, and I see both of them are crying. I can look in the window and say, they're upset about something. I don't know what they're upset about, but I could judge that there's something going on pretty bad, and I know what I'm going to walk my, walk into. Spatial perception. I wish I could do this better. If there was four boxes, different sizes and shapes, in the cupboards over there, and they're neatly stacked there, and they fit perfectly, then they take them all out of there, they put it on the floor, and they ask me, put them back in there. I don't know how it got in there in the first place. Do you see what I mean? It's being able to... Uh, it, it's what dad can do when, you know, you're going for a vacation when you were a kid and you're putting everything by the car and he says, no, 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 don't put anything in the trunk, I'll put it in. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. He puts it in the right way and it fits. So you just let him be. Okay? One last thing you got to worry about. You don't have to use your right side of the brain. Okay? It also identifies um, odors. The left side of the brain, math, logic, and problem solving, also analyzes words and sensations, okay? Ability to use and understand sign language. That's a different kind of thing. You all know what that means. It's the wrong finger. But you know what I'm talking about, right? All right? 
So that not just that sign language, but it works a different part of your brain by doing sign language than even learning, let's say, Spanish or French or German. It works different parts of your brain, the sign language itself. Recalls memory and also reading, writing, and speaking. So this is what works for the right-handed person, 90% of the population. Think of the opposite for the opposite hemispheres for the left-handed person. Okay? This is a show of hands. I'm just curious. We have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. How many people are left-handed? <laughs> one person out of 11. I mean, it's almost 10%, right? A little bit left. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? It's, okay. All right, this is just showing the same thing, just in different wording, and also over here, too. All the same stuff. All right, just get some ideas. So do your right and left hemispheres ever conflict with them, with each other? Sure. All right? Like this. Look at the chart and say the color, not the word. Your right brain says one thing, your left brain's going to say something else. Green, and you start off really fast, and then your brain just can't take it. All right? Green... See, I already right, couldn't take it already. <laughs> okay? Um, so it does. But I'll tell you what, the more information you put into your brain, the tougher things are. You think this is simple, you're just reading it, but it's not. But I ask a two year old to do this. A two year old will have no problems with this if they're obedient enough. I'll just say, show me all the green ones. Boom, really fast. Like, whoa, how'd you do that? Because they don't know how to read. <laughs> you see? If you know how to read, it's putting more information in your head. That's what's making you struggle on this. I mean, we could do this too. I could have everybody in here tell me the months of the year. Yeah, tell me the months of the year. <laughs> in alphabetical order. Oh, yeah, see? You see, this is the issue. I, I, I find that it, it's... I find that if people think, they don't want to. They feel like if they have to think about something, their brain is going to ooze out of their ears. It's too hard for them to do. Oh, God, I don't know if I want to do the months of the year in alphabetical order. Is it August and April or was it February? I don't... How do you... But if I asked you... Tomorrow we're going to have uh, an oral exam, and it's going to be the months of the year and after the quarter. How fast are you going to learn that? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? There's a different incentive. It's not saying it's impossible. It's just saying there's a different reward. And that's what you have to go on life with. Know that the nursing degree is out there. You would just have to pass through this AMP. It's doable. People have done it. Like the boxing that I've always used. Someone beat you down, and you just got to get right back up and get another hit. And di find a different way to, to take on that. All right? But people think. Fish swim, birds fly, people think. That's what we're made to do. Okay? So it's just showing you different areas over here and what they do. Right? The corpus callosum is able to integrate the two. But if you do that more often, you do more of those exercises, you're actually going to be rewiring your brain to take on other things. There's going to be, you know, I'm giving you a long list of muscles over here. Oh, why do we have to know this? We're never going to use this. You're probably right. You're probably never going to learn or use levator labi superioris alakinase. I get, unless you want to use that same story. All right? You're never going to use it. But there's going to be a point in your life where you're going to have patients on your, you may have, let's say, 19 patients, and you've got to remember people's names that sound just like muscles. Mr. Benthavania. I've got to remember that. And you've got to remember what disease he's got. He's got some weird disease and, and symptoms, tiangulectasia. How am I going to remember that? These are long words that you're going to be dealing with. They're just a conglomeration of sounds. So whatever you did... To memorize the muscles, you're going to use those schools, skills for later on in life. You're, yeah, you're going to get Mrs. Smith too, but you're also going to get Mrs. Smith, two Mrs. Smiths, and a Smythe. 
Now you got another problem you got to do. You got to make sure that this one has a penicillin allergy, this one doesn't, you know, that kind of thing. So there's challenges. Just think of everything here as not failures, but lessons that you can actually <coughs> utilize later on. Okay? So if you think about it, would you know where the cortical regions are if asked? All right, what does each cortical region do? So it's just showing you what lobes they're in is what I would be asking you about. All right, I'm not asking you where in the lobe, just know what, if you had a stroke to the temporal lobe, what is the possibilities of what you can or cannot do? All right, temporal lobe, would that affect sight? No. Would it affect hearing? Yes. You should have that understanding. So if you think about it more, there's a comical little cartoon here, right? Whoa, that was a good one. Try it, Hobbs. Just poke his brain right where my finger is. And his leg goes up. Right? We talked about that with the homunculus. Right? Let's talk about some abnormal stuff. It's kind of ironic. I did this like last semester, too, and he just died. Not, not from uh, uh, epilepsy. But Prince. Right? He had epilepsy. One to two percent of the population has epilepsy. You don't even realize that. Epilepsy is uh, a condition where a group of neurons in the brain send out abnormal or uncontrolled electrical impulses spontaneously. They just do it. So there's certain medications that are going to decrease it. Maybe they're setting off action potentials. That's why you need to know about action potentials, right? Maybe the sodium channels are opening up too fast when they should be, and we don't want that to happen, so we need something to slow it down. So we need to make sure it only slows it down up here. So there's a lot of side effects, too, all right? So the presentation can vary. It could be convulsions, typical ones, right? They call them tonic-clonic seizures. They could be just staring in the, in the air. I got, you know, someone could be just like, you know, I had a bad day with with life and I just don't know what to do. And then he wouldn't remember that he paused there. He just didn't think anything of it. That's a seizure. Okay? And those are the kinds of things that you need to pick up with your old family and friends. That, you know, you, you paused over there and you, you didn't realize that? Get yourself checked. Cause, you know what I'm saying? Not to be funny about it, because if you have too many of them, that may stop oxygen going to certain parts of your brain. Okay? Um, and it could be idiopathic, meaning we have no reason why that would happen, or it could be scarring from bra of brain tissue. Maybe there was a lot of uh, strokes that happened before, and that could lead to this. Okay? Um, cerebral palsy. This is a lack of oxygen to parts of the baby's brain, either during birth or while inside the mother's womb. Okay? Um, manifestations vary greatly on this. I used to do stand-up comedy. I had a... Um, uh, comedian who had cerebral palsy and she's able to walk and and do and she was uh, she can do it and she got a lot of laughs from it but she used her cerebral palsy as a as, as most of her jokes I guess she could do that uh, and she did wonderful a lot of people uh, really respected her and, and all but um, so she could work and do that but you have other people that um, really they can't do much of anything you know there it depends on it's a wide range of what they can do all right, so um, it varies, and it depends on what part of the brain got affected. Dementia, the condition of the mind, or being without the mind, okay? Many neurons in the cerebrum start dying earlier than what they should be, and the cortex starts shrinking on itself. It's a progressive thing. It doesn't happen overnight. If it happens overnight, that's, that's not dementia. Dementia is a, is a chronic thing that happens over months. If it happens overnight, think of infection. Something acute like that is something that, like that. Cancer doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual thing. So we have many forms of dementia. The most popular one, or common one, I want to say popular, that sounds popular most common one is what these people have. Who's this? Ronald Reagan, president, right? Okay. Do you know who this was? Actor? Peter Falk? No, Columbo? No, okay. Charlton Heston? I put Planet of the Apes on here. It's not the Planet of the Apes, right? And this is the better Planet of the Apes because it's not CGI. <laughs> it's makeup. But Charlton Heston, he was a big... Um, uh, NRA movement guy too, but he was a big star back in the 50s and 60s, 70s. So 
of Charlton Heston. All of them have uh, or had Alzheimer's disease. All right, that's the most common cause of dementia. It's idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. All right, we think not necessarily, but we think it's hereditary. All right, we haven't really we're leaning towards that, but we haven't found that connection yet. Um, well, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because it is the sixth killer in America. Not what you think. People are thinking Alzheimer's disease is just being forgetful. You know, oh, he forgot to turn off the stove and that's why he burned himself down. No. I mean, that could be part of it, but remember, it's deterioration of the brain. Sure, it hits the memory first, but eventually it's going to go to the brain stem and it's going to stop the brain stem from working. And they won't wake up the next morning. All right? So uh, it's an increasing incidence, and we're seeing this a lot. I would always say, make sure you know the top 10 killers in America. I guarantee, no matter what field you're going into, occupational therapy, physical therapy, doctor, nurse, I guarantee there will be questions, big questions, on the 10 top killers of America. Because these are the people coming into the doctor's office, into the hospitals. They want to see how much you've got exposure to this kind of material that you read about. So you better know all time of disease and read everything about it. What's the number one killer uh, in America in women? Heart disease. Good question. Good, good answer. I usually get people to say breast cancer. No. <laughs> all right. Heart disease is the number one killer for both men and women. Okay. Cancer is number two. Okay. Um, but yeah, all timers, number six. That kind of threw people off on that. So I want you to, and it's an increasing incidence. I think the reason why it's increasing is because the baby boomers, uh, usually right after World War II, we got a big uh, population uh, explosion, and now they're getting to these ages, 60s and 70s, and they're reaching that. But Alzheimer's disease usually hits around uh, before 60, usually around late 50s. But sometimes they don't know it's Alzheimer's, they just think it's senility. They're like, oh, grandpa, yeah, you could hide your own Easter eggs. But they can't really, uh, they really can't say it's it Alzheimer's or is it just senility, you know, just as you're getting older. And then you start realizing. Unfortunately, the only way you can actually diagnose this is under autopsy. So um, that's the only way you can do this. Um, so I put people up there that obviously you guys don't recognize, but let me just tell you this. You guys are all young. You're going to say one of these days, you know, let's say 50 years from now, you're going to say, oh my God, and you're going to talk to your grandchild. Oh my God, can you hear that about Justin Bieber? He's got Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> and your grandchild says, who's Justin Bieber? You're too old, Grandma. That's what you're saying about me with these people. Okay? So they wait until that time comes, okay? And you'll see Justin Bieber. Hover. I hope he doesn't, but I'm just saying people that, you know, I don't know. But no, people, you know, it's right now, Alzheimer's disease affects older people. You're not going to, you know, if you're not familiar with that. All right, but other reasons or other causes of dementia, senile dementia, just as you get older, things are not happening. You could have uh, many strokes that can lead this, brain trauma, alcoholism. I mean, just, you know, look at um, Ozzy Osbourne. I should put him up there, right? Yeah. right? So drug abuse, multiple sclerosis, a bunch of other things on here, too, that can lead that, okay? So like I said, here's what you are at 30 years old. This is what happens what we have to look forward to. So try and rearrange uh, interneurons that you never used before as you get older. You see that with people. Don't you see grandpa learning how to do Sudoku and crossword puzzles and playing chess, reading the Bible? Maybe they're their way of trying to get into heaven. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just saying, look, you're, 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 they're trying to do certain things to keep their mind going. Because certain things, they, you know, their interneurons weren't working as fast as before. So they're learning new ways. They're, 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 there's some brain cells that you just haven't used before. Your brain is loaded with brain cells, but you just haven't used them. So you start rewiring them, okay? Encephalitis. I know you really can't see it on here on the screen. You can see it better. Um, this is when you have a brain infection due to a virus. And what happens here, uh, the, the blood vessels in the brain swell up. They dilate, and more blood goes through there. You can definitely see the redness in the gray matter. A lot of blood vessels dilate there. But if you get a close, I guess on the screen you'll see it. You'll see these red dots all throughout the white matter. Those are dilated blood vessels. And that's when we can see that there's inflammation going on there. Okay? All right, so let's talk about the diencephalon. Diencephalon. 
It's located centrally in the brain and surrounded by the cerebrum. All right? It's just above the brain stem. Its major function is really just a relay area and processing center for the cerebrum. The thalamus is going to be a part of this. This is Grand Central Station. All right? There's going to be a lot of synapses going on here, um, and things go right through it. All right? So it's going to include the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, and also something called the pineal gland or the pineal body. The thalamus. Now, when you take a coronal section of the brain here, again, just to orient you, here's the brain stem. Here's the two lateral ventricles. There's the corpus callosum. There's a longitudinal fissure. This here is the thalamus. It's going to be the walls of the third ventricle. Okay? So it's the walls of the third ventricle. It makes up 80% of the diencephalon. And it's the area where many neurons are going to synapse there. We talked about those with the descending ascending tracks, mostly the ascending tracks. Okay? The nuclei on here, don't worry about it. I want to take this slide out, okay? I think it's too heavy. I don't think you need to worry about it. Just understand that there's nuclei there that's going to relate hearing, vision, taste, motor, um, involuntary, involuntary, right? It's where, it's Grand Central Station. Things going east to west, things going north to south, south, south to north, has to all go through Grand Central Station, New York City. And that's what's going on here, okay? And again, it's just trying to show you, you don't have to memorize it, but here's the thalamus, this yellow area. Everything going up is going through it, everything going down is going to go through it. All right, it's Grand Central Station. The hypothalamus. It's the floor of the third ventricle. It includes something called the infidibulum. And the infidibulum is like a cherry stem, and the cherry itself is going to be the pituitary gland. Not the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. We also have the mammillary bodies there also. And it's part of the emotional system called the limbic system, which we'll talk about. It's the origin from where the pituitary gland is coming out, which I was already explaining to you. So. The nose is over here, so there's rostral, here's coil. This is your diencephalon. This is the dark purple, is, yeah, the dark purple is going to be the hypothalamus. The dark blue here is the thalamus. The dark purple, which is the hypothalamus, extends into this cherry. That little stalk there is called the infidibulum, and it leads to the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus links the endocrine system and the nervous system. So it's going to synthesize, release, and store a number of hormones, which you'll learn about in the endocrine system. It's going to regulate uh, secretion of hormones in the pituitary gland or from the pituitary gland and at infidibulum as I said that stalk leads to the pituitary gland it's going to control the autonomic nervous system temperature center to keep your temperature there we have certain infections that will raise this this uh, body temperature gets affected there causing fevers it also coordinates heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. Coordinates it. Gets the information and sends it to the pons and medulla, which is going to keep it going. It also regulates fear, anger, hunger, and sexual libido, or what I like to call the four Fs. The fear, fury, food, and fornication. Okay. The other thing I want to say about the hypothalamus, if you haven't caught on already, the hypothalamus has so many different functions. If you have no clue on 
my exam or someone else's exams later on, which of the following controls autonomic nervous system? Which one controls fear? If you have no idea, hypothalamus set out. Because <laughs> chances are, hypothalamus has so many different functions, I'm telling you, hypothalamus is a good answer to put down. All right? The mammillary bodies, they're two little bumps that are on the posterior aspect of the hypothalamus. It involves memory and emotion responses to odors. Now, I know you know what I'm talking about with this. For some reason, I don't know why, whenever I smell Crayola crayons or Play-Doh, I think of myself four years old, for a split second. I don't want to bring people, oh, it'll probably be easier on the test if we bring in a pound of Play-Doh, they will think, you know. No. But what I'm saying is, it, it has that, you know. Um, I smell a certain perfume. I think of that girl I was with back in college. Even though it's been 20 years ago or something. I smell mothballs. I think of grandma. You see what I mean? I know what, you know what I'm talking about. There's certain smells that make you remember things. And that's what I'm saying. What creates thought? It's an amazing thing. Okay? Even 20 years later, you still think of that stuff. The epithalamus, going towards the posterior aspect. It's above the thalamus, and it's the roof of the third ventricle. It includes the pineal body, or the pineal gland. And please don't get mixed up with pituitary gland and pineal gland, two different things. So what it is over here, The epithalamus is over here and extends to this area here, the white area, and that's the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is actually extended posteriorly. Pituitary gland extends anteriorly. Okay? The pineal body or pineal gland extends posteriorly, and it's to do with the circadian rhythm. You're in New York City. You travel over to Japan, it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Japan, and you're yawning away at a board meeting. Just tell them it's the pineal body speaking. All right? You're on an old time zone kind of thing. You're, you have to, it's jet lag. Okay? Um, it also releases a hormone called melatonin. Not melanin. Where's that? Ooh, you learned something, right? <laughs> See? All right? Yeah, melanin is in the skin. Melatonin is in, it comes out of, it's a hormone and it comes out of the uh, pineal body or pineal gland. Okay? Um, it induces sleep. It also, we don't understand the whole mechanism, but it has the on, it causes the onset of puberty. Now, I mention this because you can get melatonin over the counter as a sleeping aid. You don't need a prescription for it. And I know a lot of people, including my parents, they think anything you can buy over the counter must be safe for you. You know where I'm going with this. Um, melatonin is a hormone. And a lot of people, not a lot, but a handful of people like to get melatonin and think it's safe. Or not, you know, they don't want to give a sleeping pill to their seven year old child, but they're having problems sleeping. You know, warm milk is just not cutting it, or counting sheep is not cutting it. Let's give them a pill. Um, now, I don't think one pill is going to make a difference with this, but if it becomes a habit, you give them one pill every day or every other day, don't be surprised if you have precocious puberty. At seven years old, she has a period. You see what I'm saying? Because it has something to do with the control of onset of puberty. We just don't know the whole mechanism. So everything you use, it's not totally safe. All right? Questions about that? All right. Basal ganglia. Okay. This is gray matter that's scattered within the white matter in the brain, and it's lateral to the thalamus. I'll show you where this is. It includes three different nuclei: globus pallidus, putatum, and caudate nucleus. You do need to know those. This is where they're located. Here's a coronal cut of the brain. There's your thalamus over here. Here's your lateral ventricles. There's the corpus callosum. This is where the basal ganglia are. They are lateral to the thalamus. It's the green areas here. Okay. If you cut tra a transverse cut through the brain, like this, 
Here's the thalamus over here. This is going to be your ventricles, the light blue, so the dark purple is your, your thalamus. It's the light pink areas that are the basic ganglia. All right, just so you have an idea of where they are. They're lateral to the thalamus. Functions. It's going to help initiate movements. What muscles to contract first in order to get from point A to point B? It will help terminate movements. How do you know when to stop contracting that muscle? It'll suppress unwanted movements. You see? I wanted to do that, but something was supposed to hold me back. I kind of told my basal ganglion, don't hold me back, let me do that. Okay? So it suppresses unwanted movements, regulates muscle tone, it has something to do with memory too, short-term memory. There's this feedback loop that goes in. As you see, things go up to the, you know, sensory is going to go up to the postcentral gyrus, get scattered throughout the whole brain, and you're starting to realize how complex this is. It has to go through the basal ganglion before it goes to the precentral gyrus to go down as a cortical spinal to move that. Because it has to know which muscles to contract first, which ones to stop first, and which ones not to, con not to contract so you don't have that unwanted movement. It has to be filtered here. So the sensory motor association from the cortex are all collected, and this information then arrives at the caudate nucleus and putanum. And processing goes in there to figure out what, how to order this whole thing. The info is then sent from the globus pallidus through the thalamus, and it goes to the motor cortex, which is going to be the pre-central gyrus, to your pyramidal cells of the cortical spinals. All right, so it filters the last place. Okay. Now, substantia nigra, which literally means black substance. Its neurons will inhibit the activity of the basal ganglion, making sure, as a last resort, it's making sure that, you, you sure you want these muscles to contract? Yes, okay. It's like the last place. Now the neurotransmitter here is dopamine. Okay? So, let's talk about Parkinson's. Alright? Parkinson's. We have damage to the substantia nigra and the substantia nigra neurons. Why? We don't know. Something damages it. All right? It's idiopathic. We don't know the cause of it. This is going to decrease dopamine secretion because you can't release the dopamine. So it's going to increase the activity of basal ganglia or the nuclei. So there isn't any checks and balances going on and you're gonna have gradual increase in muscle tone, rigidity, walking like this, rigidity. And other symptoms of Parkinson's, you get tremors, this unwanted movement, you wanna pick up something. You have slow movement because it's really rigid, inability to move because you're so rigid you also have a reduced, usually, depends on how severe it is, a reduced facial expression. We call it a, um, um, it'll come back to me. <laughs> a flat effect, I'm sorry, flat effect. Uh, that's, it just, it just hit me. Um, but you have this flat effect. We just have this look over here. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm, I'm wonderful. I just had my birthday today. I'm wonderful. You see a very flat effect. It doesn't express much over there. Um, you also get this pill rolling. Um, pill rolling. It's like if, if a pill was in their hands, they would be rolling it. You probably see that. They're going like this. It's like they're, they're rolling a pin in, or a pill in their fingers. They call it pill rolling um, movements with their fingers. It's like you're rolling a pill. So this is a chronic degenerative disease that's going to decrease the amount of dopamine. It's the substantia nigra. We don't have a cure for this. Okay? 
Uh, substantial denial will normally prevent unwanted movements. You're going to get all these unwanted movements instead. So the treatment for this is simply, let's increase dopamine. Right? But we've got to increase it in the brain. So we have a treatment called levodopa, or L-dopa for short. And what this is, it's a derivative of dopamine. And it can get inside the brain and can be break down, or it can turn itself into dopamine, and it goes that way. Um, and it would do wonders. The problem is, we got to give them a big dose of it because the blood brain barrier is there. When you do this, the amount of L dopa that gets into the brain is only about 5 or 10%. So you got to give them a bigger dose. The problem is, there's dopamine receptors, which we didn't talk about, elsewhere in the body. So they get flooded with dopamine, and all of that actually gets increased then. Because none of it really went into the brain. Does that make sense? You have these side effects that happen. So this is only good for the early signs of the disease. When you get later signs, we, we, we cap off. We can't do anything. Then they start getting really wild. They, they get excessive, uncontrolled movements because these uh, receptors for dopamine elsewhere are just turned on. We call it dyskinesia. Don't worry about that. But basically, you got all these. It gets really exaggerated. So the medication then has to be stopped. Okay? Interesting thing. Um, so you have this wobble over here. Their, their face is this dull kind of called a flat effect. It just there's no expression on it. Posture is bent like that. Okay? That's what that is. And these are people that had Parkinson's probably don't know him. Do you? Have, you any, have any of you heard of St. Jude? Okay. He's the one that started it. He was a comedian back in the 1950s and 60s. You might know his daughter. Yeah, Marlo Thomas, yeah. Okay. Who played um, Batgirl. Oh, the 1970s Batgirl. Okay. Um, but he, who did she marry? Donahue. Man, is this, I'm just, I'm just showing my age now, huh? Uh, okay, anyway, um, but he died, he had Parkinson's. Uh, you probably all know him, right? He's now the poster person of, uh, and, and the big uh, person who's dealing with all the research in Parkinson's, right? Uh, Michael Fox, or Michael J. Fox. Um, you probably know him from Back to the Future. I know him as Family Ties. Um, but anyway, that's, that's him. Uh, Vincent Price, you guys know who Vincent Price is? You probably know his voice. He was back in the 1960s, a lot of the movies, scary movies, but he, his last movie he did was Edward Scissorhands. He played the father, the person who created Edward Scissorhands. But you probably know his voice, Michael Jackson's Thriller. You know that monologue? I don't know how to say it, but he, he's a guy, you know that kind of, that was his voice, that's him, okay? Um, Pope John Paul II had it, and just coincidental, he died recently. Um, you can see that Muhammad Ali. This is in his prime, but you can see. Look at his face. This is just before he died, about two years before he died. And he has that flat face. Parkinson's. Okay? All right? So those are people on there. Now, there's also a movie that I recommend you watch. It's called Awakenings from 1990. Uh, this is from... Uh, it took, it, it, anyway, it's from 1990, but it took place of how the L-Dopa became... Popular. He's the he was the doctor. Robert Williams played the doctor. It was not a comedy. Uh, he played the doctor, and Robert De Niro played the patient with Parkinson's. He did a wonderful. I'm surprised he didn't get any kind of, of uh, nominations or anything. But um, it shows about the whole thing with El Dopa, what they had to go through and try to make it pass, and people weren't believing him. And uh, it's it's a good movie. Try and watch it after the semester ends. Okay, but it's a uh, pretty popular movie. Probably get it free now. I mean, it's one of those movies. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of digression. So, um, okay. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. What about the people with Parkinson's? Don't they have, like, deep brain stimulation? Like, what do you mean? Maybe, maybe it's not Parkinson's. Or what do you mean, deep brain stimulation? Like, they implant, I guess, like, that they implant actually something in your brain and it's actual, like, like elect yeah, electrode stimulation. Maybe the new research, I, I'm not aware of it. 
Pro- maybe if that's there's what it a, is. There's a video that they they show that he has the the um he has the simulation done. He has the little like machine and the doctor turns on. And he's yeah. Done I, it and all of a sudden he's regaining control and. Yeah, I. It, it, it's not a famous person, is it? No. No. So I don't. I don't know. I, I would imagine something like that, but it's probably not FDA approved yet. Oh, okay. They're probably doing experimentation and probably sign waves instead of anything goes wrong. Here. But um, I can imagine something like that because they even have ele- um, ECT, electrical, uh, electroconvulsive uh, uh, therapy for depression. That works actually wonders. Mm-hmm. It's scary with just hearing it, but it, you go over here and it's it doesn't make it like sh- it doesn't electricity go. It does, but it it's not like you know like Frankenstein kind of thing. Uh, you don't even realize it, and uh, it does wonders. So uh, it could be something like that. I don't know, but it's probably an experimental kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Other questions? No. Okay. All right. Let's talk, talk about the limbic system. The limbic system is the emotional part of your brain. Okay. So there's different parts. Uh, we call it the limbic lobe. So it's a different kind of lobe. It really integrates all the other. It integrates all the. Um, all the lobes themselves. A little bit of frontal, a little bit of parietal, occipital, and so forth. So it includes all the lobes. It links the conscious with the unconscious too. You know, um, you're conscious about watching a movie, but certain movies make you tear up. You don't know why. Certain songs, very emotional ones. You know, The Cats in the Cradle. You know, I get a little tear in my eye. And yet my father's fine. I always had a good childhood. I still treat him well but still got a tear in my eye. It's that unconscious thing, right? But you're conscious about it. Um, so it's the emotional brain is what we call it. It deals with emotions, memory, mood, motivation, behavior, olfaction, and so forth. This is what it is. It's this red area. And please don't get mixed up with this red area with the corpus callosum. Here's the lateral ventricle. There's the corpus callosum. And above that is going to be the limbic lobe. You can also see it this way too, all right? It's this kind of like dolphin that kind of goes over here. It's not like the, it's not like the Starship Enterprise, like the, uh, the ventricles that I showed you before. It's this whole thing. And these are the parts, all right? Limbic lobe, even the hypothalamus is part of it. Mammillary body, this is part of the hypothalamus. Something called the hippocampus, uh, amygdala, olfactory bulbs, and fornix. So the limbic lobe, integrates sensory input and adds emotional you know pain you start crying you know your grandmother touches you on your back and you haven't felt that from her in a long time you might get a little tear in your eye you know especially if she just got up from a coma or something you know what i'm saying the hypothalamus also deals with emotion right we talked about it the four f's right um mammillary bodies uh, integrates sensory, especially odor, with memory, as I showed you before. Right? I smell a certain perfume, I think of a certain girl I was with in college, that kind of thing. The hippocampus, there's a long t- it deals with long term memory and creating new memories. I think most of you would love to stimulate your hippocampus to turn whatever you're reading into something that you can remember for a long time, not for just an exam, for everything else. There's three types of memory. There's long-term memory, there's short-term memory, and there's instant memory. Instant memory is this. What letter is that? Instant memory is this. What does that say? You didn't have to go k-a-t, right? You just had instant memory. You know the sound is cat. Instant memory. Short-term memory is things like if I tell you three items like uh, stapler, pickle, doorbell. And I, add, I tell you those, remember those, so write them down. And then 10 minutes later, I ask you, what were those three words that I talked to you about? If you tell me two of the three, your short-term memory is good. Okay? Long-term memory. Who's the president? How many children do you have? 
Short-term memory usually goes first. Where did I put that cell phone? You're talking to me right now on it. Oh, I'm out. Short-term memory goes first, okay? Then the instant memory, and then the long-term. All right, instant memory does go. You know, sometimes you get brain farts. That's instant memory. I, it, like I said, it was flat effect. It took me a while. That was going on me. Gotta do something with my memory. But the long-term memory lasts for a longer time. This is why Grandma forgets where she puts her glasses, but asks her, Grandma, what, what was it like when you gave birth to, to Mommy? Oh, I remember we had the Three Stooges come out, and they put me in a gurney over here, and I wore this shirt and that. They remember everything about that, but they don't remember where they put the glasses just two minutes ago. You see what I'm saying? They're great storytellers. They just can't tell you about something that happened earlier that day. Okay? Amygdala controls emotions, interprets facial expression, new social situations, identify danger. This is where autism hits, is in the amygdala. Okay? Interprets new social situations. They can't do that. They want the usual thing. Don't throw them into something that, you know, it depends on how severe the autism is. But don't put them in an area that they're not familiar with. You don't know how they're going to react. But this is where, for yourself, how to deal with that. You don't like to go to parties, and yet you're forced to go to a party. What should you do? Uh, give me a drink, and I'll just stand over here by the fishing bowl. And if people come up to me, I'll do that. But I don't know if I want to get myself, I, I just don't like that many people around me. Right? You kind of adapt to that. All right? You interpret facial expressions. Since you're mad, that kind of thing. Okay? The fornix really just connects all the parts of the limbic system together. Okay? All right. The brain stem. Three parts. Midbrain, pons, and medulla. And... There's tracks that go up and down here. Think of certain tunnels that are in there. And those tunnels are called the medial lemniscus or lemniscus. All right? It's a route that really the tracks will follow in the brain stem and are in all parts of the brain stem. We talked about medial lemniscus earlier when we talked about the tracks. So what you got here, again, this is the inferior portion of the brain. You have the midbrain here. There's the optic chiasm where there's optic nerves kind of cross over. There's the mammillary bodies, those two little bumps. Here's the midbrain. The pons is over here, and the medulla oblongata is here. Midbrain, pons, medulla. That's the brain stem. Just be wary. When you hear the word midbrain, people think, oh, it's the middle of the brain stem. No. It's just found in the middle of the brain. It's the top of the brain stem. The word kind of throws people off. Pons means bridge, and it bridges the two parts. So the midbrain is the upper portion of the brain stem, okay? And we have, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Cranial nerves three and four come out of the midbrain. It's going to include things called the cerebral, I love this word, peduncles. <laughs> I'm going to call my kid peduncle. Hey, a little peduncle, come here. The peduncles, the two bulges on the ventral side of the midbrain. All right? And this is where we have ascending and descending tracks going in there. There's also something called the corpora quadrigemina, and that's going to control eye head responses to visual stimulation, also head response to auditory. I hear a big bang over there, my head moves over there too. A big light comes over here, my eyes will move there and then my head will move there also. Does that make sense? You do this all the time, I'm just trying to explain to you, this is a manual about yourself. Why does it all happen or where is it all coming from? The red nucleus, it's called red nucleus because there's tons of blood vessels there, it looks very red. This is going to control muscle tone and posture. And then we have the substantia nigra, which is also found part of it 
in the midbrain, and that's going to inhib inhibit unwanted movements. The pons, like I said, it means bridge, and it bridges the midbrain with the medulla. And it's a re relay station for descending, ascending tracks. It also is involved with a respiratory rhythm. It switches on and off the breathing. Doesn't control it, but how do you know when to stop inhaling? This tells you to stop. How do you know when to stop exhaling? This tells you to stop. It switches that on and off. And it's also the origin of cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight. Modulo obligata, big one to know. This joins the pons to the spinal cord, right where the foramen magnum is. We have these medullary pyramids that kind of look similar to the peduncles. They have these two ridges that come out, these two bulges that come out on either side. And this is a common place where the crossing over occurs for many of the ascending and descending tracks that we talked about. It's also the origin of cradle nerves 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, I'm not going to ask you where they're coming from, so don't worry about that. But understand that cranial nerves 3 through 12, most of them of the cranial nerves come out of the brain stem. And we'll talk about the cranial nerves next uh, lab session. Other things about the medulla. We have the autonomic nuclei. We have the cardiac center. It alters the heart rate going faster or slower and the force of the contraction of how much of the cardiac output can get pushed out, how much of the blood can get pushed out of the heart. It also is going to control blood pressure, so it has a vasomotor center. Respiratory center receives input from the pons to say how much should we breathe in, how fast should we do that. Other autonomic centers, emesis. What does emesis mean? You don't know what emesis means? Yeah, it means vomiting. So if you take an anti-emetic medication, something that's going to stop you from vomiting. I wouldn't think. But if you ever see that bowl, if you ever go to a hospital um, where your mother or your friend is, you see this bowl that kind of shaped like this. It's usually pink or purple. You see something like that? It's about that. No, it's about like that big. And it curves. And it's about that deep. That's called an emesis bowl. Okay? People are like, well, why don't you just brush your teeth in there? That's an emesis bowl. That's why I'm not. You know? All right? Um, but that's what that is. Okay? <laughs> that's a glycian or a uh, dead glu the, That means swallowing. <laughs> okay? Coughing, hiccuping, and sneezing. So all of this is also going to be part of the medulla also. Okay. Um, sensory motor um, nuclei, you're going to have uh, the four cranial nerves, nuclei 9, 10, 11, 12. And we also have relay nuclei in there too. We kind of uh, talked about this with the dorsal columns. You'll have the nucleus there for the gracilis, the nucleus there for cuneatus. Or gracilis, now that you understand the gracilis muscles on the leg, the nucleus gracilis is going to take care of below the waist, the lower extremities, the ascending coming from there. Cuneatus is going to be the upper extremities. Okay? Um, and then the olivary nuclei are information from the spinal cord, cerebrum, and the brain stem to the cerebellum. So this is stuff that's going to, these, uh, the olivary nuclei are going to funnel it towards the cerebellum so that it could coordinate things. So again, just so you can see it again, Medulla, I'm sorry, um, midbrain, pons, and medulla. All right, you can see the two little peduncles. Okay. I only put this picture here not to confuse you, but just so you can appreciate where the cranial nerves are coming from. The majority of them, ten of the twelve, are yellow, and they all come from the brain stem. The only two that don't is the olfactory and optic, which we'll talk about later. Cranial nerves one and two don't. Reticular formation. This is a hard one to define. But we're almost done with the, with the brain. 
So we, we've covered mostly everything about the brain for you to know. So the reticular formation is a good place to sort of end with it. Reticular formation, it's any gray matter of the brain that is still left unlabeled. And gradually, as more becomes shown of it, more labels will appear. And the reticular formation gets smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? I don't know how else to explain it. It's like the leftover. But the leftover is soon going to be no more leftovers. Because we're going to have labels to them. Okay? Well, the reticular formation is pathways in all three parts of the brain stem. And it includes something called the RAS, or the Reticular Act Activating Synth System. And this is important to keep you awake. Now, obviously. <laughs> so right now, the reticular formation is not working right now. We could get it activated. <laughs> See? Now it all woke you up, right? Now the, re the RAS is actually working, right? And when that alarm comes, you know, rings in the morning, that wakes up the RAS, all right? So it makes you alert. It makes you awake, all right? So the re reticular uh, act activate the RAS, all right? Sensory neurons that project to the cerebrum, and it keeps you awake. So think about this. If they're not working at all, how would the person pre present themselves? But you said it. Coma. They're in a coma. The RAS is not working. They're in a coma. Does that make sense? All right? All right, so that's what happens with this. So motor portions aid muscle coordination and tone. Injury to this will be irreversible coma. Yeah, it makes it not awake. Okay? So it's just trying to show you where the RAS is. It's over here, and then it projects into the cerebrum. Okay. All right, cerebellum. This is the last piece I'll do with you today. Okay, the cerebellum. It's not too bad. Cerebellum um, is that part of the brain that's right here. All right. So here's the person's nose. It's in the posterior inferior area of the brain. Okay. It sits on top of where the fourth ventricle is. There's the fourth ventricle. It lies posterior to the fourth ventricle. Okay. It has two hemispheres, and it's connected by something called the vermis. So it kind of looks like a butterfly, and that the body of the butterfly is the vermis. And I'll show you a picture of that. There's wrinkles there, as much as you've seen wrinkles in the cerebrum. There's also wrinkles there, and it's called folia. And if you actually cut through the cerebellum like this, a sagittal cut, it's going to make a wonderful delineation of a tree. We call that the tree of life. It's where the gray matter surrounds the white matter and it pictures this tree of life, which is called arbor vitae, all right? Which means tree of life. And you'll see that in the models, you'll see that in the dissections, you'll see this wonderful thing. You know, I guarantee you'll want to take a picture of it and put it on your fireplace mantle, okay? So that's what it looks like underneath. You've got this vermis over here, the folia, that's all these wrinkled areas. You've got a lobe on this side and a lobe on that side. Okay? Specifics, it's only 10% of your brain by volume, but like I said, 50% of your neurons are in the brains, are, are in the cerebellum. Okay? You also have peduncles here. I love peduncles. Okay? So you've got peduncles there. You have superior peduncles, middle peduncles, and inferior. I won't ask you about these different peduncles, okay? Um, so don't worry so much about it, all right? Although I like the peduncles. That's a close-up of Arbavite. Really nice. All right, you'll take a picture, fireplace mantle, all right? Um, now, functions of the cerebellum, all right? We, we dealt with some before. We talked about some, but I want you to know some other ones, too. It evaluates the sensory input. So yes, it does go, all the information goes into the um, post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. It's a sensory, primary sensory area. But it's also going to go into the cerebellum to say, what should we do with this information? It has to still go in there to coordinate things. It also deals with spatial perception. We 
You know, if you're trying to be balanced in between a very tight corner and you're on a um, like a small bar, it's helping you balance and being able to spatially, how do you, or, or let's say how fast should you go in between, you know, you're driving your car and you have to go through the toll booth. You know, are you gonna fit through there? Yeah, you're gonna fit through there, but you know, you gotta go pretty slow to do that. Balance in equilibrium, as I talked about, controls subconscious aspect of your skeletal muscle. Someone pushes me here, I don't have to think about which muscles I have to do to not fall, it does it automatically. It also does timekeeping center, predicts movements of objects. Good quarterback has a very good cerebellum, right? I'm going to throw the football and I got to time it just right if the receiver has to get it right there. Or a skeet shooter, right? I'm going to shoot the gun and they're going to throw the clay bird. I got to make sure that the bullet is going to hit the bird at that same time, right? You got to, and that's where you can train that cerebellum to do that. It also helps to distinguish pitch and similar sounding words, rhymes. So this is the kind of stuff that you want to start children at a young age, okay? And planning and scheduling tasks. All about A and P, right? A and P is not hard material. It's more of a time management course. When's the best time that you can study this? When I'm gonna have time to, you know, I gotta do the birthday for my child. I gotta uh, do work. I have to do. You gotta figure out where to put this all in, okay? And cerebellar injury, you could permanently damage it with trauma or a stroke, or temporarily damage it, drugs and alcohol. But of course, like Ozzy Osbourne, the drugs could actually lead to the permanent. And the disturbance in the balance and gait is called ataxia, right? Someone drinking too much, you have that off gait, that walking. 